Property bulls turn property bears with 25% crash this year. So before I share with you guys these 20 year plus property bulls who have now turned property bears, and according to their data, says that we could see up to 25% fall in property prices this year alone. Uh, I've got a whole bunch of information and data and charts and uh, to, to share with you guys. So this video, we're just going to go into all this data uh, regarding the housing market and all the risks. Yes, I am a property bear now. I've been a, a investor in real estate for, for a long time. I've sold four of my six investment properties. So I've got two left, no debt on them. They're just cash cows. So I'll keep those ones. But uh, anyway, let's get into this video. So we don't have time to do any clips. So I'm not going to cut to any clips today, but I will put a link in the description below uh, to this video uh, done on the Wealthian channel, 30% uh, housing crash. Um, Everyone should watch it, but in particular, if you're from the United States, I definitely recommend watching it. And the other video that I just want to highly recommend is from the George Gemmon channel. He did a video about a month ago, can the housing market survive higher interest rates? Once again, if you're from the US and you haven't watched it, I highly recommend it. Uh, in fact, to be honest, if you're from Canada, New Zealand, Australia, the UK, wherever you're from, uh, I highly recommend you watch both these videos and I'll put a link in the description below. But in this video, we don't have time to cut to any clips. Okay, so Ben Rickett tweeted this. The US Treasury Index's year-to-date 2022 return is now down 8.5%, representing a significant loss in the value of US government bonds. But it is the drawdown that highlights the pressure facing most multi-asset funds. The worst drawdown in nearly 50 years. And we're going to talk about this 40-year bond bull market, which I believe has come to an end shortly. And from my buddy Tarek, uh, shares this chart of the 30-year fixed mortgage rate. And he says there is this idea that Aussie mortgage rates couldn't possibly double, that it's an impossibility for a variety of reasons. Uh, and he shares this, that pretty much they've doubled in the past 16 months in the U.S., this is the largest single tightening cycle in relative terms ever. And I've shared previously on videos six, seven months ago. So in Australia, we, we have, you know, predominantly up to five year, one to five year fixed rates. We've got two lenders that will do a 10 year fixed rate, ANZ and Newcastle permanent. Uh, the rest do one to five year fixed rates. We don't do 15 and 30 year fixed rates like in the US. But seven months ago, you could have got a five year fixed rate at 1.89, 1.99%. Now, you're looking at around 5%. All right, so I've shared these type of charts before, but this is the latest one that we've got, the ASX 30-day interbank cash rate futures implied yield curve, and it just keeps rising. And now, um, you know, the market is predicting that the cash rate will be 3.73% by August next year. So just over a year away, we're looking at 3.73%. We're nudging that 4%. So if the Market is right. The cash rate's going to be pushing 4%. What do you think mortgage rates are going to be? And here, policy rate expectations. So markets expect central banks to aggressively address inflation. But if they follow the path below, it's hard to envisage soft landings in these economies. Once again, if you have a look at Australia down the bottom right, you can see that you know, the market is, is expecting uh, that the RBA will raise rates towards 4%. And that means we're going to see uh, mortgage rates around 6 to 7%. And here, one of these 20-year-plus property bulls, uh, economist and former advisor to the Gillard government, Julia Gillard, a former Australian Prime Minister, Stephen Kukala, says, no surprise what happens to bond yields when central banks stop buying them and therefore end the extreme distortion of pricing. and this is something I've been arguing for a long time that you can't look at the bond market and listen to it because it's been distorted by central bank buying. And I just love this chart, which a lot of Australians don't realize. So that blue part, that is the term funding facility that the RBA gave the banks 
$200 billion facility over a three-year term at 0.1%. And basically that's, you know, by next year in 2024, that thing gets wound up. So, you know, this, by the way, this was tweeted out by Lindsay David. And if you haven't bought his book and read his book, Lindsay David is an Australian economist and he's written a book about the Australian property market, which I highly recommend you guys uh, go out and buy. Just Google Lindsay David uh, Economist book. Um, and he says, RBA kicked the can down the road bailout in all its glory. Hard to reverse with raising rates and banks required to refinance the blue section in 2023, 2024 at a much higher rate. And that's the thing is now that bond yields have risen, banks have to refinance that. It's a three-year term. That three-year ends in 2023 and 2024. That's $200 billion worth that needs to be refinanced at market rates. So even if the RBA don't move on, on the cash rate, you're going to find your mortgage rates are going to lift because the bank's funding costs for those mortgages are going to rise significantly. And I'll just highlight, look how much uh, domestic bonds, both federal and state government bonds that the RBA bought at the beginning of the Cerveza sickness. And here, my buddy Tarek tweets out, Perth residents with jobs, mortgages turned to charities like Food Bank, Anglicare for help. One in six people that comes to us for assistance at the moment has a mortgage. Now, that would have been unheard of only three to four years ago, head of Anglicare. And that's the thing. According to Digital Finance Analytics, Martin North, his data shows what about 42% of all mortgage holders are in mortgage stress. Mortgage stress measured on a cash flow basis, cash flow in versus cash flow out, 42%, something like that. I don't have his most up-to-date numbers, but it's about that. And so people with these big mortgages are getting hit with inflation. Their living costs are rising, and very soon they're going to see their mortgage repayments rise significantly. And, well, a lot of Australians have never experienced this, but they're about to. Now, a lot of people say, oh, Steve, don't worry. People's got fixed rates, so, you know, they're sweet. Well, yeah, people took three, four, and five-year fixed rates in 2020 and 2021. And here's one of our uh, top four banks, big four banks in Australia, uh, NAB, National Australia Bank. And they've got 72% of fixed rate loans expiring over the next two years with early engagement planning underway. And if you have a look down the bottom left-hand uh, side, sorry, bottom right-hand side, uh, the fixed rate home loan expiry profile, you can see that in the uh, six months to September 23, okay, so the second half of next year, 62.9% of their fixed rate customers will unwind onto a variable rate. Or they can look at refixing again, but as I said, fixed rates are now around 5%. However, if that cash rate is to be believed, if the market is right and the cash rate around September 2023 is going to be pushing 4%, then these people are going to come off you know, 1.99 rates to 6 to 7% variable rates and you know, fixed rates will be you know, somewhere uh, accordingly. So. A lot of fixed rate customers, and a lot did fix in, in the last couple of years, over the next 18 months, a lot of them, so the, according to NAB, 72% of their fixed rates expire over the next two years, with 62.9% of them expiring by September next year. Now, I've shared this chart before, and this is the new loan commitments in Australia. And you can see that pretty much there's been a trend line right through that until the Cerveza sickness, where governments allowed people to take uh, funds out of retirement, gave new grants to buy housing. Everything was chucked at housing. At the same time, people were given mortgage uh, repayment holidays. People who were in trouble did not need to sell. And so what do we see? We've just seen huge inflation. So the expansion of currency through new loans, that's what inflation is. And where's it going? To housing. So seeing this bubble, uh, the, the rise in property prices over the last 18 months or so has not surprised me one iota because of this chart right here. However, if you think that almost vertical line in 
new loan commitments growth is sustainable, then you do not know economics. And this is what the Austrians call uh, a crack-up boom. And it's a crack-up boom in property. And this is not sustainable because it needs to continue to expand upon itself. And this chart just shows that uh, where the lending has gone and uh, it's gone, or the growth anyway, the growth has gone to investor mortgages. So people looking at the housing market in Australia as an investment, uh, not not for housing, not for shelter. They haven't invested into, into you know, uh, starting their own business, uh, you know, into into the, the corporate market. Uh, you know, we're not building or, or producing anything. We're simply speculating on property, hoping that it's going to go up because the majority of properties are negatively geared. We don't have, uh, you know, positive cash flow in Australia. So we lose money holding property here, hoping that someone else will pay a higher price down the track. Yet that's, you know, the Australian, that's the Australian economy, property and dig stuff out of the ground. Now, in recent years, and in particular since the, uh, the, the, the Cervasa sickness, this, this is a concerning chart. So this is debt to income with households uh, or, or above six times household income. And this is what uh, our regulators warn uh, the customers who are likely to default under, under much higher interest rates. And, you know, that's quite a, quite a large percent of people getting loans with debt to incomes above 6% of household income. So, yeah. And you can see on this chart that those with uh, debt to income ratios above six uh, for both owner occupied and investors on average is around that 20% mark. And those with over eight, so these, these are high risk people. Uh, we, we're looking at around four to six percent of people with those loans. They're the ones who are going to be in trouble with interest rate rises, and a lot of those in that six to eight bracket. Now, a lot of people say, "Oh, that, Steve, that's all right. It's just a minority, you know. Like it's just, you know, what eighteen percent, nineteen percent of owner occupiers with debt to income uh, over six, and what about twenty seven percent of investors over." a debt to income of six and oh look look at the eight percent plus it's it's what four four to six percent of of the market so it's only small well check this chart out so this is delinquencies uh in the us and go back to the gfc delinquencies peaked at 10.12 percent of total loans okay so it's you only need the marginal borrower to go under to cause other people to go under, and you only need 10% to cause a financial crisis. Now, I'm not saying that we're going to see a financial crisis in Australia. We may do. I'm not saying we are, and I'm not saying we aren't. All I'm saying is there's a lot of people with debt-to-income ratios extremely high, what the Australian regulators say are extremely high and and very uh, concerning about and, and high risk of defaulting. And so, if we get that that four to six percent in that eight percent, uh, eight eight times debt to income uh, ratio going under, then they'll drag a whole heap of the six to eight percent under. And could we get to ten like the US did in 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 the peak of the GFC? Well, of course we can. So the majority of people will be fine; they'll be able to make their repayments. But it's the marginal buyer, it's that marginal debt holder, that mortgage holder that can create all kinds of trouble for the housing market, for any market that is. So as I said, the lending has not gone into private business investment. So this whole Keynesian thing of, uh, you know, look, if we cut interest rates and we can boost productivity and we can pr- produce, uh, increase uh, business investment, create new jobs and that, no, 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 that is crap and austrian economics told everybody this years and years ago that all you're going to do is juice up asset prices and that's exactly what they did and look that's keynesian in itself the wealth effect uh businesses obviously looked at that and went well that's artificial 
And when you do this artificial rates, you get this uh, Austrian business cycle theory where you uh, overcapitalize because you 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 don't you can't measure things properly based on on the real real cash rate. And so what a lot of people do is they they overinvest. Uh, they you, you then get malinvestment. You get a misallocation of resources, and then it comes back to bite you in the you know what. And so we've had whether it's uh, private investment or, or non mining business investment. Lowering interest rates has actually reduced uh, private business investment. And you can see here that the productivity growth in Australia has just gone down and down and down. As we've cut interest rates, it's just gone down. It's done nothing to boost the economy. All we've done is inflated asset prices. And then we've gone and borrowed against those asset prices to consume. That's it. And the great uh, Austrian economist, Dr. Richard Ebeling, says you can't consume unless you produce. You can't demand unless you supply. So here in this chart, you can see every time the RBA cuts interest rates, dwelling prices go up. House prices go up. Every time they cut rates, house prices go up. And what have we seen in the last two years? Interest rates cut all the stimulus, like so much inflation, so many new loans created going towards housing. This is what we call uh, you know, malinvestment. And as interest rates rise, this is going to come and bite people in the you-know-what. And I think I got this chart from Lindsay David. Um, so the red uh, arrows there are when the RBA raise rates and you can see when they raise rates, property prices fell. And then the green um, lines are when the RBA cut rates. And then you can see, oh, yep, every cut, uh, cut in the official cash rate, dwelling prices go up. Now, I've shared this chart before. And this is a pretty scary chart. Um, uh, my stockbroker, Tony Lacantro, shared this one. Where can the RBA raise rates to? Well, they can't spell raise, but anyway. So down the bottom there, have a look. So 2%, 2.5%, 3%. And then look at the repayments as a percentage, as a percentage of income. So we're talking, uh, the market is predicting that the cash rate will be what? 3.73% by August next year. So even at 3%, based on uh, annual incomes and the Sydney median house price, we're looking at 71% of people's income just going to repayments, plus all the other inflationary living costs that we've, uh, that we've got, you know, plus food. Like, people just, I, I, don't, I don't know what people think. You know, I do videos about Australian property and I get smashed by people. Property is a religion in Australia, absolutely no doubt. Because no one in Australia has experienced a downturn in, in property during the GFC, Canada and, and ourselves. We we didn't feel it. We didn't feel it. And so everyone just thinks buy property and it goes up. You can sit on your backside and get rich. Well, I've got some news, folks. Those days are ending. You ain't going to be sitting on your backside getting rich. It's going to be those moving forward. It's going to be those that produce that get rich. So... You know, just have a look at this chart. Now, aren't we hearing a, a lot about this? You know, central banks talking about a soft landing. Well, yeah, uh, back in 2007, central banks predicted a soft landing for, for housing in Ireland too. And what do we, what do we know about that? What they fall about 56% from peak to trough from memory. Here's a chart of what Irish house prices look like from peak to trough. That's, that's nasty. That's nasty. Now, a lot of people will push back and say, yeah, but Steve, in the US, they had, you know, um, uh, non-recourse lending and, and, you know, in Ireland, they had other rules and, you know, you can't compare to Australia. Well, I highly recommend you guys watch this video. I'm not going to go into it now, but basically uh, I, I shared in here and I broke some myths about that because I, I've been an investor in the US 
uh, housing market. And out of the 50 states and, and the D.C. area, only 11 are non-recourse. A non-recourse lending, meaning you can hand your keys back and, and the bank can't come after you. We have non-recourse lending in our super funds here in Australia. So if you buy a property in your self managed super fund, then that's non-recourse lending. Um, but the rest in, in the US, so the other 39 states, they're recourse lending. And in Ireland, if you actually have a look at the mortgage documents that you signed over there, if you default on that, you can actually go to jail. So they've got much, much, so they do have recourse lending over there and they've got potential jail time. So their, their rules and laws are much harsher than Australia. So I, yeah, anyway, watch this video. I go into it in more, more detail. I'll put a link in the description below. So some people like Harry Dent, and to be honest, even Professor Richard Werner is warning that what's happening across the West is the Princes of the Yen. Now, if you haven't watched the Princes of the Yen, I'll put a link in the description below. It's a documentary based on uh, Professor Richard Werner's book, Princes of the Yen, uh, where he was an advisor to the Bank of Japan or to the uh, Ministry of Finance in Japan. I can't remember which one. Uh, and worked for many, many banks and, and investment firms in Japan. Uh, he actually speaks fluent uh, Japanese. And he says that it was a purposeful policy to, to, to make economic, social, and political change in Japan. So they built up a bubble and then they crashed it. And he argues that that's what's happening in the West as well. They want to change our uh, economic structure, our political structure, and our social structure. And the way to do that is you create a bubble and then you burst it and create a crisis. And look, Harry Dent says that we're going down something similar. Now, I don't really follow Harry Dent too much these days. Uh, I don't listen to Harry too much. But, you know, there's a lot in that deflation camp. And I definitely think asset prices are heading down. But do I think that, um, you know, Aussie property is going to end up like uh, Japan, where, what, 30 years later, uh, house prices haven't even got close to back to their peak? I don't subscribe to that. But people just say, Steve, housing cannot go down in Australia. Well, us, people in the Northern Territory in Perth, um, in WA, what they think about properties falling. Because from 2014 through until the beginning of the Cervasa sickness, uh, Perth was down, what, 20-odd percent over that period of time, that six years. So it was a very slow burn, but... They fell over a six-year period about 20%. And uh, Darwin uh, was a lot more. Darwin was around 40% or pushing 40% over that same period from 2014 until the beginning of the Cervasa sickness. So we did have two major capital cities in Australia fall significantly uh, over a period of time. So could we see that again? Absolutely. But even in Australia, we saw in that 2018-19, that 12-month period leading up to the last federal election, where the Labor Party had, uh, you know, gone to the election saying that we're going to remove, you know, negative gearing and changing the capital rules uh, discount, uh, capital gains tax discount rules, and so just with that, we had no economic crisis, unemployment was low, interest rates were fairly low, everyone was doing well. Um, you know, Sydney house prices in 12 months went down 11% and Melbourne went down 10%. And you can see Perth and, and Darwin, they also went down quite a lot in that one year, one year. And actually, if you look at the peak to trough uh, of Melbourne and Sydney, it fell 10 and 13% from peak to trough during that time period up until the election when uh, when Scott Morrison won and then everyone knew, okay, so we're, we're sweet, we're going to keep our negative gearing and we're going to keep our capital gains tax discount um so you know to think that property prices can't fall and this was with interest rates low and there was no interest rate rise or anything during this period there was no cerveza sickness and there was no rise in unemployment to speak of yet it fell this much in such a short period of time now one of the big risks for australia is australian banks uh our banks their balance sheets uh, are highly leveraged to residential mortgages, way more than any other country in the world. And this is what I mean. Australian banks stop lending to businesses 
Now, we know Westpac nearly went broke. I think, was it 91, 92, 1990? I can't remember offhand, but uh, I, was it the Packer family that bailed them out? I, I can't remember the details. I'm sure some of you in the comments below can, can uh, you know, help me out with that one. But I do remember Westpac being in trouble in the early, early 90s. And that was to lending towards businesses. So a lot of banks change shift and went, you know what, houses are more safer. We'll just lend towards houses. We won't lend to business. And so we haven't had that business investment. We haven't had that growth in productivity and uh, we haven't produced real wealth. All we've done is pushed up asset prices. So what if asset prices come down? Does that mean our wealth is down? We, that shouldn't impact the wealth of our nation. We should be producing things and competing with other nations. That's real economics. That's real production. That's real wealth. So here's a chart where I argue the 40-year bond market is over. So investment strategies that worked over the last 40 years, I believe, are finished. So that 60-40 bond, you know, stock bond ratio, you know, I believe we're in a new environment. So as investors, we have to look at previous uh, bond bear markets and look at asset classes that did well in those times. Uh, the problem is we've been trained over the last 40 years and we've got this recency bias, it's a pretty long recency bias, mind you, of what investment strategies worked over the last 40 years. But with that bond bull market dead, in my opinion, uh, you know, we need to look back, go back further in history to have a look. So you know, if, if, if you think the bond bull market is going to continue, I think portfolios are going to be destroyed. So, and this chart here, this is the Fed uh, interest rate. Uh, so you, raising rates, no surprise, because the Fed funds rate simply tracks a two-year bond yield. And this is the real bond king. Jeff Gunlock actually argues we should just get rid of the Fed, I agree, and allow interest rates just to follow the two-year treasury note. Here in Australia, it's more the three-year, but in the US, the two-year uh, bond yield. And you can see this tracks it just with a nine-month lag. Uh, so yeah, and the thing is, debt servicing burdens are going to rise sharply in the coming years, and people have loaded up on debt. If they didn't load up on debt, we could probably handle these rate rises. But anyway, we'll see. So I love charts like this. I just love charts that go back, and this is the long-term interest rates back to seventeen ninety, and as I said, I believe we have had this forty-year bond bull market and it's ending and we're going into a bear market we're going to see much much higher interest rates moving forward and here's just another chart of the long-term interest rates so you, know, you, you may think that you know we're just gonna do what japan does and just keep yields to the floor i don't think so uh yeah i can't remember where i heard this story but uh, there was an employee at the Fed. Uh, he was either a security guard or something, and he was being shown around. I think this was uh, just recently. One of the former uh, Federal Reserve members was sharing this story and showing a picture of... Uh, uh, his name escapes me. Who was the chairman of the Fed in the early 70s? Uh, I can see his face. Anyway, whoever it is, once again, guys, this is Finance Uncut. You know, no script. I just say things off the top of my head. So uh, help me out. Write it in the comments below. Who was the Fed chairman in the early 70s before Volcker? Anyway, there was a painting that he did, and the security guard just said, oh, that's whatever his name is. I've forgotten. Uh, he's the guy who let inflation out of the bag. And so what they're saying is, what the argument is, everyone remembers central bankers who allowed inflation to get out of the bag. They don't remember what the unemployment rate was, but they know that inflation was bad. And so politically, you know, inflation is bad. And it's bad for central bankers. It's bad for politicians. And so, you know, they will raise rates. And politically, I, I think that's what's going to happen. So this chart came across my desk uh, last week, uh, real home prices versus real disposable income, uh, the US and Canada. And I was like, whoa, look at Canada. And, you know, everyone talks about the US housing being in a bubble. 
Yet, if that's in a bubble, what's Canada? But then I went searching and I wanted to find a similar chart for Australia. And, well, once again, look at US down the bottom right. Yet they're calling that a bubble. Well, if they're a bubble, what's the UK? What's Sweden? What's New Zealand? What's Canada? And look at Australia. Australia makes Canada look affordable. <laughs> um, not sustainable, folks. So while doing my research, I found this chart as well. So from the Dallas Federal Reserve, it's a little bit older, but it just shows that Australian house prices per capita income is way more expensive compared to the rest of the world. Australia, hey, we take the gold medal in uh, housing unaffordability. Now, something to remember. So in the first five months of the Great Recession, the GFC, when the housing crash began in the US, house prices fell 3.46% in the first five months. Okay, guess what? New Zealand and Canada have surpassed that. So here you can see New Zealand, Auckland, uh, the first three months of the year, down 4.5%. Wellington, the first three months of the year, uh, down 6.4%. And here, Toronto home prices dropped for the second straight month in April. And that's because both Canada and New Zealand are ahead of Australia. Their central banks have raised uh, already and raised significantly. So in New Zealand, their cash rate's now 1.5%. What are we? 0 0.35? 0 0.35. And they're at 1.5%. So yet market markets are predicting that Australia will be pushing 2% or over 2% by the end of this year. And here is that property bull turned property bear, Christopher Joy. Wiping $1.5 trillion off house prices will force RBA to pause after 100 to 150 basis points of rate hikes. So he argues here specifically Australia's household debt to income ratio is sitting around 186% in line with its all-time highs and also global highs. We project that the RBA will likely be forced, if it acts prudently, to pause its monetary policy tightening process after the first 100 to 150 basis points of cash rate hikes. Well, New Zealand's already in uh, you know, 150 basis points. They're already at 1.5%. And funny enough, our largest uh, lender, Commonwealth Bank of Australia, the CBA, says that 1.25% uh, is the breaking point. At 1.25%, house prices start to go down quite quickly and he says as a result of the commencement of a record 15 to 25 percent decline in aussie home values so he says for every 100 uh, basis point rate rises we'll see a 15 to 25 percent decline in aussie home values so he says given the total value of residential real estate in australia is currently worth 9.9 .9 trillion we're talking about the RBA inflicting losses on households with worth some $1.5 trillion, assuming just a 15% drawdown in national home values, which is at the lower end of our expected range. And remember, that's only 100 basis points. The precise size of the additional out-of-cycle hikes we'll see from banks is not known, but their funding costs are soaring, and they have already aggressively repriced three-year fixed-rate home loans from 1.98% only 12 months ago to 4.5% today. Non-bank lenders are similar, similarly wearing an overdue repricing in their cost of funding via a steady increase in the credit spreads investors require when they underwrite non-banks by investing in their RBMS, uh, RMBS. So yeah, as, I, as I argue, um, the bank's funding costs and you know their $200 billion uh, facility with the RBA, uh, that expires in 2023 as well. So they need to refinance all that cheap debt cheap loans that they've been uh, writing as well. And in 2013, we repeatedly warned the RBA publicly and privately that by slashing its cash rate, it would precipitate the mother of all housing bubbles powered by double-digit house price appreciation. Between 2011 and 17, the RBA floored its cash rate from 4.75% to 1.5%. Over this time, national prices soared an amazing 41% based on CoreLogic's All Regions Index which includes both capital city and regional markets, or by 48% using the 8 capital city index that excludes regions. 
And what have they done since the beginning of the Cerveza sickness? Well, they floored the rates from 1.5% down to 0.1%. And what have we seen? A housing bubble. I showed you charts earlier where it, you know, housing credit growth uh, just goes almost vertical. So between 2015 and 2017, APRA, that's the uh, Prudential Regulator, Limits on credit creation forced lenders to materially jack up interest rate on investment property loans. In early 2017, we argued that this would result in a 10% decline in national house prices. Between 2017 and 2019, the eight capital city index price slumped 10.2%, while not much was happening in the economy, as I was talking before. Now, yes, we did have that federal election uh, that I mentioned earlier. It was the biggest fall in house prices since the early 1980s, where, what was it, 1982, we had 25% house price fall from memory. In mid-2019, we forecast that future RBA rate cuts would drive house prices up 10% over the next 12 months, which is what we got. The eight capital city index rose 10.3%, while the all regions index climbed 8.9%. This seemed to come as a surprise to pretty much everybody. The real howler for the RBA and bank economists was their forecast for a big house price decline during the <clears throat> and their inability to anticipate the stonking recovery. In March 2020, we projected a very short and shallow correction of 0 to 5%, following, uh, followed by capital gains of up to 20% starting in September 2020. CoreLogic's All Regions Price Index fell 2.1% between March and September in 2020. The 8 Capital City Index declined 2.8%. Thereafter, started climbing quickly again. And look, during that period from March to September or March to probably July, I was expecting property prices to fall significantly. The banks thought up to 32% fall. The RBA was saying similar things. Even Macquarie Bank said it's 100% guaranteed we're going to see house price falls. However, when we saw the amount of people taking uh, you know, $10,000 each in each financial year, so $20,000 each out of their retirement accounts. So a couple, that's $40,000. And then the governments are giving away forty, forty-five thousand dollars $45,000 in grants. So you could have eighty dollars to $85,000 worth of grants for a first home buyer to buy a home. And even if you weren't a first home buyer, you could still get one of the grants. So you could still end up with about 60 odd thousand plus all the other um, you know, things they're throwing there. And then you had the rate cuts from the RBA. And then you had the RBA bail out the banks by giving them a $200 billion facility at 0.1%. So what the banks do, they just lent like crazy. So yes, then I started to go, hang on, hang on, we're going to see something crazy happening here. And then also the big thing was uh, people that were in mortgage arrears didn't have to sell their properties. They could just sit there and not pay their mortgage. That just got capitalized onto onto their loan. So either they started making a slightly higher repayments when they started repaying again, or their loan term just got extended. By October 2021, the All Regions Dwelling Value Index had indeed increased by 20%. In that month, we controversially updated our forecast to include at least another 5% of national price growth until the RBA started increasing its cash rate in the second half of 2022. More importantly, we forecast that national home values would then correct by 15 to 25% after the first 100 basis point RBA cash rate increases which would represent a record drawdown in Aussie households' most valuable asset. The RBA obliged with an initial tranche of 25 basis points of hikes yesterday, or that was last week. So 15 to 25% fall with a 100 basis point increase. So when the RBA raises rates 1%, according to Christopher Joy's data, that will force properties to correct by 15 to 25%. What's the market? predicting 3.73% was it 3.73% by August next year so he and the commonwealth bank think that the rba will stop around you know 1.5% because properties will just fall too much even though the rba have said that by the end of this year they're looking at around a 1.5% cash rate uh we've got Goldman Sachs says, no, 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 it's going to be 2.6%. I think it's going to be about 2%. But then the market thinks that we're going to see 3.5% by middle of next year. 
and then pushing towards 4% by the end of next year. So if a 100 basis point, we'll see properties fall 15 to 25%. 200 basis points, what are we going to see 30 to 50% fall? What about 300 basis points? 400 basis points? Now, a lot of people would say, like Christopher Joy, that as soon as they get to that breaking point, they'll stop. Well, if they do, then say ta-ta to the dollar. At this point, it's either asset prices fall to fight inflation or protect asset prices, but say ta-ta to the dollar. As house prices start rolling over in earnest later this year, we expect the RBA to modulate the pace of its monetary policy tightening process in response to clear evidence that its transmission mechanism is working. If the RBA has learned anything from the uh, Cervasa sickness, it should be the importance of being data dependent. So there you go. Christopher Joy, a 20-year-plus property bull. Stephen Kukalis, 20-year-plus property bull. Stephen says that interest rates are going much higher. This is where they differ. Stephen Kukala says that interest rates are going into the threes. The cash rate is going into the 3 to 4% mark. Christopher says that, no, once we get to 1.5%, the RBA will stop because the, the falls in property prices will be too much. So he says for every 100 basis points, we're going to see 15 to 25% property falls. If Stephen Kukala is right, and we're going to see the... Uh, cash rate between 3 and 4%, then according to Christopher Joy's numbers, we're going to see much, much deeper and larger property falls, property price falls. Now, even if Christopher is right and they stop at 1.5%, yet the Fed continues to raise and other bond yields continue to raise, well, guess what? Banks' funding costs are go going to go up. So they're going to pass on higher mortgage costs. Higher mortgage rates are coming. So, you know, I'm not saying the RBA is irrelevant, but in many ways they are. Mortgage costs are going up. Interest rates are rising. And people with housing debt, and we've seen in our, our business, we've, we've, been, we've, we've had a mortgage-breaking business for almost 20 years across Australia or across the east coast of Australia, in Queensland, New South Wales, and Victoria. And we've seen what clients have done in particular in the last two years. Uh, and so we look at that data and we do surveys and we find out and we get a lot of information to see what people are thinking and, and people's financial positions. And it is my opinion that Christopher Joy is right, property bull now turned property bear, that we are going to see that the gains pretty much in the last two years, wiped out. And if and that's based on 150 basis or 100 basis points. So if we see much higher cash rates, then we're going to see much higher property price falls. So, you know, that's, that's just my opinion. So just remember, you know, prior to the 1929 crash, not just John Maynard Keynes, but everybody... You know, they said we will not have any more crashes in our lifetime. They said we have reached a permanent plateau. And what did the Austrians say? What did uh, Ludwig von Mises say? A great crash is coming. And what happened? You know, economic laws, they do not cease to exist just because we pretend that they aren't there. And disregarding them, well, they come at a cost. As Ludwig von Mises said, economic history is a long record of government policies that failed because they were designed with a bold disregard for the laws of economics. And I believe what we've seen is people trying to go against the laws of economics and people are going to learn these laws of economics the hard way. And so I encourage you to pick up a book and start reading about Austrian economics. It's what I believe gives me the edge as an investor and I just want to highly encourage you guys uh, Austrian economics is no longer mainstream economics and understanding Austrian economics helps me to see the errors and, and the mistakes that other economists make because they just don't get it they just don't get it 
And I've done a book, uh, sorry, I've done a video on my top favorite uh, economic uh, investment and trading books. And in there, I talk about my favorite Austrian economic books and, and I share which ones I think people should begin with. So I'll put a link in the description below if you want to watch that and get more information on where to start an introduction to uh, Austrian economics. Anyway, guys, if you like this video, please hit that like button. Really do appreciate it. I'd love to see your thoughts and opinions in the comments below. Obviously, there's a few things in this video that I have forgotten that I need you guys to help me out in the description below. Take care, everyone, and I'll see you all again on another episode of Finance Uncut.